Welcome to the Fifth Coin Online and Urban Real Estate Research Unit uh, webinar. Uh, for those of you who've been with us with, in our previous webinar, welcome back. And for those of you who are new, uh, it's great uh, to have you among us. Um, over the last few weeks, we have been looking at a number of different topics uh, in these webinars. We, as COVID started influencing uh, the property environment, we had a look at the demand and supply, how the market could possibly change, the impact on the economy. Um, effect, effect, we also had a look at finance, and I think it's going to be something that we'll want to discuss around this. Uh, in the seminar or the webinar that we're going to have uh, here at the, at the moment, we are going to be looking at PropTech. Uh, but of course, FinTech has an important role to play in all of this as well. And these are issues that we want to look at. So we've been looking at finance. Um, we've been looking at some of the technologies. We've been looking at planning, even looking at architecture, how we're going to look at space. And what we're going to be doing uh, in the next uh, 35 minutes or so is focus on PropTech. Much has been said around uh, the PropTech environment over the past few years. And I think it's always worthwhile to bear in mind that this is not merely a COVID-19 story. These are trends that have been with us uh, certainly for the past few years. And if anything, uh, the argument is being made that um, the present scenario may well accelerate quite a number of the trends that were with us uh, in the past. We have a panel with us. Um, let me start with Sean Goodoy, who'll be joining. We'll, I'm, I'm going to ask the panelists to say a few words uh, in a moment. Uh, we have Luke Boyle with us. We have Wayne van der Fent. And I'll be doing this as a duet with Rob McGaffin, who will be with us uh, as well um, in assisting uh, with, with the whole process. And uh, Kayla Banwell is, is, is with us from a te technology perspective, making sure that it all happens uh, um, uh, as we progress. So we've got a great team here. Um, let me let me start with uh, Wayne. Do you want to say a, f a few things, just uh, just uh, from a matter of uh, introduction, just to introduce yourself? Wearing a prop tech type hat today, but I suppose the best way to introduce myself at the moment is a bit of a property entrepreneur, in that we are doing various things in the property space. Um, from residential developments through to, through to uh, technology in the property, software technology in the property space. Um, having come from the PIC in a previous life, I've, I've obviously set up the sort of cutting edge of, of property, whether it is property development, property sales, um, Probably purchasing and so, and trying to use that expertise in, in, in terms of developing new things and, and also finding new ways to be, to be involved in property. You know, property is a, both property and prop tech is a broad church. And I think it's impossible for any one grouping to probably cover the whole gamut. And so for me at the moment, it's about focusing largely within the transactional area. Wayne, thank you very much. Uh, Sean, um, a few words of introduction to get, get us going. Thank, thank you, Francois, and uh, thank you to Coin Online and Eureka. It's uh, great to be here, and it's a really interesting forum. So, yes, thank you. Um, yes, as Francois said, my name is Sean Godoy. Um, I operate independently through my consultancy, Diversity Property Solutions. Uh, we offer a range of advisory and training solutions to the industry. And I'm also co-founder of the SA PropTech Association and PropTech Africa Associations, uh, which uh, basically aim to connect and promote the PropTech uh, industry and, and connect the ecosystem and community. Um, so yes, quite uh, from a traditional property background, we're quite uh, passionate about innovation and PropTech in the sector. Very, very good. 
Luke, a few words from you. Uh, I'm Luke Boyle. I work at the Urban Real Estate Research Unit and my field of research is urban development, uh, more specifically looking at technological development and how that's influencing the way cities in Africa um, emerge. And I guess all of this prop tech stuff sits on a backdrop of an urban context. So I guess I'll be providing some context to that today. And I think that's an important point that you immediately make, Luke, that, uh, and it's something that we're going to be discussing in this webinar. It's that linkage between the urban environment and properties in the property market. Often we look at them in isolation. And I think the strength is to bring those worlds together and how they function together. Rob, um, just a few words from you before we get started. Thanks very much, Francois, and uh, thanks to, to, to uh, but very happy to be joining this. I think this is our fourth or, or fifth one. Um, and so I'll just gonna be helping you out to, to hopefully ask some, some um, interesting questions. Um, and uh, to, to delve a bit deeper into what it actually means beyond the technology. In other words, the technology itself is interesting. And obviously there's some very uh, innovative stuff happening in that space. But to delve a little bit deeper and understand how is that technology changing the value chain with respect to property? In other words, in what ways are we using the technology to improve the property development and transaction processes? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's, uh, uh, Sean, let me start with, with you. Um, I remember around 2016, I remember going to a seminar where suddenly somebody was talking about a concept which we all know well, blockchain. And I remember that clearly. I was on that plane flying back. I said, I better get my, better understand what blockchain is about. And I was back at, at UCT in a seminar and, and somebody said, hey, Prof, you know, do you think blockchain is going to impact? And I had a bit of a blank at that point. <laughs> Um, it just shows how we have moved uh, over the past few years. Um, so, Sean, where are we at? Uh, where are we at with PropTech? Uh, maybe we can even talk about blockchain later, because I think that gets us a bit more into the urban environment and how our town planning schemes work and, 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 and so forth. So, where, where are we at? Um, sure, yeah. Um... That's the, that's the big question, I guess. And you make a really important point, uh, like you used uh, the example of blockchain. Um, things have moved along and uh, with PropTech, uh, there's, I don't know if it's come full so cycle in some places, particularly um, also in overseas developed markets, but there's some people who uh, won't even use the term PropTech anymore. It's just now a fundamental part of the industry, which is a key point okay. I wanted to make off starting, starting off with is that it's not separate to the industry it's it's part of the industry so uh, one of the very popular examples is uber you know that wasn't a new transport industry that was part of the sort of taxi uh, short-term transport industry so it's the same as prop tech so i think it's important to look at look at it as fundamentally part of a wider innovation within the industry uh, which is quite exciting you know it's property could be said to be sort of uh, one of the last industries uh, to, to sort of embrace innovation and technology on a meaningful scale. So it means there's a lot that's been done that's really exciting, but there's a lot more uh, to mm -hmm. be done. And a lot of companies, I think property companies need to, to sort of relook really at their innovation strategies, their digital strategies, because, uh, you know, there's increasing pressure from changes in the environment to uh, consumer user demands, mm -hmm. um, and also in the operating environment with costs, et cetera, and staying relevant and even space, you know, remaining relevant. So innovation is important and technology a lot of times enables that uh, for them to stay relevant. Um, in general on activity, there's, there's been positive activity. Uh, talking in a South African context now, um, we, with Urera, I did a report last year on, on the SA PropTech uh, sector and we did a map as part of that. And uh, we uncovered a lot of interesting um, activity that uh, I've been tracking since then that was reduced, uh, produced in February last year. There's been uh, additional prop tech companies and, and service providers coming into the market. So we're seeing a lot of interesting activity. Um, there's also improving awareness. Uh, more and more corporates are, are making a move and at least, um, uh, ver you know, uh, what's the word, uh, ver verbally or, or making the statement publicly that they're looking at technology. I think it's become, you know, 
with some perhaps it's it's, it's a bit of PR etc staying staying relevant but it is uh, being noted as something that has value add and it's not just a nice to have uh, which is the big difference I think in, in a lot of this a lot of uh, landlords and service providers might look at this technology as great you know gadgets and uh, interesting things to to talk about and maybe go view at a conference but in terms of implementing it, they're probably not fully convinced, but that is changing. Um, and the rise of more prop tech content research, prop tech associations has really helped us along um, because uh, you know there's been a lot of talk of the prop tech and what it can do, but I think the wider conversation is important. And obviously, platforms like this are really exciting, um, and, and companies obviously like Coin with what they're doing. So the the um, conversation is changing, which is promising. So Sean, on the one hand, I think you're making a point here that there has been a high level of integration of prop tech that we almost shouldn't be calling it prop tech anymore, but uh, just call it the property sector with the, te the technologies involved. But on the other hand, I'm, I'm also picking up from you that not all the technologies have maybe been adopted. Um, I suppose we can get back to this, but do the users have a very exper different experience in 2020? than they did uh, four or five years ago? Um, or do you still have the, the, the broker who arrives at your home and says, uh, in half an hour, please explain your life and uh, we'll try to find something that suits you? Uh, um, or that has AI taken over yeah. much of that? Or do we still have somebody who's looking for a tenant who's sitting at the dinner table with the... Uh, uh, 50 applications of people who could possibly take my flat and has no idea how to sort them out. Mm. Um, and I suppose some of the questions, and I don't know if you want to comment on that before I move on to Luke, but um, I yeah. suppose. It's, it's, a, it's an important one because there's obviously various uh, categories of prop tech, which we used in, in the map that I mentioned that we put together. Uh -huh. Um, yeah. And a lot of one of the biggest, uh, most active categories of, of prop tech technology in the industry uh, is sales, sales and letting, and that's that's a global trend, um, yeah. along with management and services, because property management's a big thing on its own. Mm -hmm. But what you touched on there with the broker, the agent, obviously that falls under sales and letting, and um, like like a lot of sort of technological innovation mm -hmm. in industries, people worry about. Uh, losing jobs and, and being made obsolete, being replaced by a machine. And the state agents and brokers, you know, I think when this conversation started with PropTech, that was the main worry that there were platforms that would basically cut out the middleman. Um, okay. And what, what we've seen is that that does happen, but there's a bit of a hybrid approach. And I don't, I think you need the human touch. I'm going to get back to the value chain. I think we, what, what we do want to check is who is threatened here? I mean, are lawyers threatened here? Are brokers or property management companies? And I think it's going to be important that we discuss the, the value chain. So we're going to get back to, to that. What we now need to do is move on to the urban environment. Uh, there's a lot of new technologies entering the urban environment. I've been told that in the next few years, uh, certainly in the South African case, we won't have robots on street corners. We'll have automated vehicles driving through our cities that will know what car has stopped where. But let's have, a, let's have that discussion now. So, Luke, um, I suppose my question to you is, and pretty much the question that I asked Sean, where are we with smart cities, digital cities, uh, and what can we expect? And also reflect a bit on the research that uh, you have uh, undertaken. Okay, sure. Um, so yeah, just a, a point on what Sean mentioned about how prop tech is and, and technology in the property industry is now seen as part of the property industry. And, mm -hmm. and I'd say the same thing is actually happening in the smart city space too. We do get a lot of labeling though around smart, digital, wired city, ubiquitous city, intelligent city. And a lot of these terms are appropriated for various interests and values. Um, and a lot of meaning gets lost. And um, I think what is happening though is people are just starting, starting to understand that technology is intric intricately linked to the way cities develop now. And you can't see the one in, is in isolation of the other. Uh, so just a point on, on that from Sean. Um, and then in terms of the research that I've been doing, um, I've been looking at smart city development in Africa. Um, and I'll just try 
give a, a brief overview of what, what I've been doing in that space and some of my findings. Um, so I've been looking at the city of Cape Town mostly and then other smart city initiatives around South, South African metros. And something that's come up time and time again is, is this issue of the digital divide. Um, and this is a critical area that needs to be addressed before a smart city can be promoted as in any way as a socially sustainable urban area. Um, without digital equity, these technologies are likely just to only entrench these, these social and spatial fragmentation, which, which is so pervasive in African cities. Um, so that's an incredibly important point that we need to, to consider. And it, there needs to be a coordinated effort to address this issue because it is quite a layered issue. Uh, many people think that it's now narrow, narrowly view it as, as, as purely access to connectivity, but it actually goes deeper than that. It's also the access to the technology in terms of the devices that people have access to and also the digital skills development because you're pretty limited to what you can do with technology and connectivity unless you have the skill set to be really be able to unlock that. So that's the first kind of massive chunk of, yeah. of research that, that, that has kind of emerged. The second is that um, there's, a lot, there's a lack of strong leadership in this space. Um, city governments are, are really struggling to like, truly embrace the smart city concepts and, and embed them into their institutional frameworks. Um, so what I mean here is, is the focus is often on um, technological innovation, but less about the organizational management and the, the policy innovation that's required. Um, so there's a tends to be a focus on the, the hard infrastructure, but it's actually, it's really the soft infrastructure that unlocks the potentials of ICT. Um, and technology is, is merely the enabling component. And that's something that very often gets lost in the smart city space. Um, another thing in the kind of the, the African context is that um, tech firms often promote a kind of a one size fits all approach to smart cities, which is inherently flawed. Um, technology alone won't solve anything. And the technology needs to be appropriately aligned with the contextual challenges and the organizational and the existing organizations and institutions that are in that context. And yeah, again, this is particularly important um, in the African context. So in yeah. some of my conclusions, I would yeah. say that um, we basically need to recenter the discussion, the smart city discussion around citizens, the citizens' needs and, and, and how technology is useful to citizens and, and to meet their ends, which means technology needs to essentially be delivered at the level of the citizen. Um, so citizens need to be able to use it, they need to know how to use it and it actually needs to be useful to them. We get a lot of kind of supply side driven initiatives and gimmicks that don't really address citizens needs and are kind of profit by, by these tech firms as, as a one size fits all solution to cities. And that's something we need, really need to be cognizant of in the African context. Look, I think that's, that's you know, really interesting. And I think it, it gives that context of technology. You know, it can all be about cool things, you know, and uh, drones and, you know, and we, we see these things. And, and I think what, what you are getting at here is the, is the critical impact that technology can have on society and also who it can exclude, you know. Um, does it enhance the disparities? Do we leave more people behind uh, through these technologies? Um, we see it as the answer of everything. Um, so anyway, I, let's get back to that in a, in a moment. Um, Rob, we, we had this discussion around the value chain. Uh, um, in the in the property sector, and um, I don't know how you define that value chain. But there are different definitions to it, but we and and I suppose, Sean, it touches on the point that you made is who should be most fearful uh, in the value chain, um, and then Wayne, maybe you want to also c c come in, in maybe once uh, Rob has reflected on this. Is, is it a threat or is it, you know, is it the same threat as we saw with the first industrial revolution where uh, the workers got very nervous about the whole thing. We sometimes forget where the word sabotage come from. I suppose the French work for a clog. Workers were putting their clogs in, the, in machines to stop uh, these machines from, from operating. Um, and you sabotage the system in that system. I'm not saying here we're into the sabotaging of, of technology, but uh, uh, how, how do different players interact in this? Uh, Rob? 
Thanks, Francois. I, um, look, I think you can probably define and describe the property value chain in a lot of different ways and, and, and to sort of high levels of sophistication. But if you, if you cut to the chase, um, I think there's really got this sort of four key aspects or but elements. Uh, with respect to that value chain and if for me it's we use space we develop space we transact in, uh, with space and or transpect transact space itself and we manage space right. and I, i've seen with a lot of the 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 technology to date there, there seems to be a, a sort of a focus on that transaction area Yeah. And I'm just curious to hear from, from both Sean and Wayne, um, are we seeing that technology starting to uh, impact uh, other areas of the property value chain, particularly, you know, how we use it, how we but develop it and how we manage it? I think part of the problem at the moment, Rob, is that there isn't enough usage for it to play, certainly within the transactional space, If you take, for example, if you've got everybody operating on a platform where rentals that were done today were recorded, it would effectively mean that you would have live information in respect of market rentals, and that would impact on how one does your valuations. If you had market information that was live today, of transactions that happened today and the pricing that happened, it would effectively give a much better sense on how I price my own property and, and, and that transactional side. Mm -hmm. right. There's a whole lot of data that can be utilized that obviously current, currently isn't because it's very bitty. You know, that's, there, there is that aspect to it. The other is that particularly in the property space, and I think Sean could probably either bear me out or correct me, is that often property players tend to buy technology that doesn't integrate. And so I've got technology that does my property management, I've got technology that does my accounting, I've got technology that checks on whether my building is still there. And, and none of that technology integrates with each other. And a lot of the integration happens via the Excel spreadsheet. And, and so that Excel spreadsheet is always the interface between one, one system I have and, and the other. And, and within that lies a lot of, of inefficiency because you take it to a point And then you go manual. And, and, and for me, I think that's where currently people are not seeing the value because a lot of the value is going to emanate from the data, I believe. So, for example, if we had a lot of, of the stuff live, answering or responding to consumers' needs would be a lot easier and a lot faster because we would know what their needs are. So, for example, if we had a system where everybody was leasing and we were able to plot what they were doing with that space, we would be able to determine what space is required in Claremont at this particular point in time because you would have seen that empirical data coming through over the last few weeks or months or, 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 or the like. So it is at the moment, a lot of it is anecdotal. And, and, and I think that is for me where, where, where the problem lies. Okay, so Wayne, I think you're raising the important point, which I'm going to get both Sean and Luke to reflect on, and, and that is the issue of integration. Uh, uh, Rob, uh, I think, and then maybe, I, I don't know if you have something else that you'd like to, uh, to focus on, but, but it's, you know, I've heard people say the problem, and I think Wayne, touching on the point that you were making, we bring these technologies in, uh, sometimes it's relatively cheap just to cut the whole system out because it didn't do exactly what I wanted it to do. I had, because I haven't integrated it. Um, and, and, and yes, it's not just, and I suppose that's the point. It's not just an Excel spreadsheet. It's different way of working. 
uh, the, the different way of operating with that technology. And often there's this view, we're going to carry on doing the same thing, but now we've got a little bit of technology that we've got, um, but it's not going to alter the way we do things here. Uh, um, is that right, Sean? I mean, is that some of the issues that we're dealing with? And then, look, I want to talk to you about it because they, we've been told that the answer to all of this is blockchain tech technology. And then I hear people saying, well, that's fine, but if the municipality hasn't digitized its plans and things of that sort, well, that part of it falls away and, and we don't have an integrated system. So how do we integrate? Yeah, Sean? Yeah, these are um, really, I think, important themes that, that Wayne and yourself, Francois, just highlighted. Um, Wayne mentioned data and then integration. And in terms of the wider, I'm not a, a tech uh, expert, but Obviously, looking at PropTech, there's, there's the wider uh, technological themes that come into play. And a big one is data, and then using that in a way to, to create it and package it into big data, plug it into AI and machine learning, um, which is, you know, we've seen a lot of applications in, in finance and banking, et cetera. And the other thing is integration. So I think these are two key parts, like you've both highlighted, that okay. perhaps the property industry hasn't embraced uh, on, a, on a meaningful level. On the data side, um, there's a lot of data already, especially if you think of property management, um, the amount of data that just gets collected and I don't think a lot of gets done with it, but it's also the way it's collected and the system you're using um, that, that collects it properly, stores it properly, manages it properly, and then plugs into something that gives meaningful insights. Um, and a big one of those, like Wayne said, on a transaction side, if you're having more uh, real-time live transactions through you know, tech-enabled platforms, uh, that gives a whole lot of uh, extra trans transparency and extra insight for property markets, which is really interesting. So the data one is, 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 a, is a big theme. Um, and a lot of technology interventions, they have a data footprint. So you're going to be creating more data, uh, interesting data that, that you can use the more you ad adopt a technology. Um, the other thing, the integration, I think this is a really important point, and this is the, the, the area, I think, or the, the issue of greatest traction, I think, in proper adoption. Because like I alluded to earlier, you'll get some big property companies or any type of company um, stating, you know, that they're embracing technology and they might use uh, a certain uh, a piece of, you know, prop tech, like say a broker app um, in, within a property fund, um, which, is, which is interesting in itself. But, you know, the full benefits only come with full integration and plugging all these systems into each other, how you manage the property, how you lease the property, how you analyze investment opportunities. Um, and the technology enables that, but perhaps it's, that's, that's the sort of the lack of understanding or the lack of trust. Um, and a lot of this is, is the, the magical word that the techies use is the APR, which I just Googled stands for the, the application programming interface. So this is the tech magic Did that you enables. Know what it was, Sean? <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I, I knew the concept of an APR, but I never knew what it stood for. But if you, oh, ask, okay. if you ask a lot of tech people, I don't think they, they know what it stands no, for. No, okay, okay, fine. <laughs> Thanks, folks. So, I just want to come back and just follow up on that then, both with Sean and Wayne. Um, so we have seen a lot of, of activity in the transaction space, and you've started to allude to some of the areas. Where do you think the technology is moving to in terms of the different aspects of the value chain? Um, I know, Sean, like you spoke about, and Wayne, you did as well, about the use of the big data, the data that gets created. Um, you know, do we move away from a point where we don't need to do a census every 10 years because we can access all of that information in real time uh, off people's Facebook pages or something like that? But I'd be interested to know where's the next sort of horizon with respect to the technology? Where's, where's the pace it's moving into? Okay, look, but let me move, and then we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that because very critical to the work that I think you are doing, Luke, is I think we mix up smart cities and digital cities and uh, the data that cities collect and what they do with that data. Uh, I mean, Rob made the point around census, around, uh, what are your views around that, Luke? So I just first quickly want to respond to, to what Wayne said and what Sean said. Um, you know, we talk about linkages between the prop tech and, and the space and the smart city space and data is, is one of those things that does that. I mean, if you think about city governments are using data to drive resilience and improve service delivery, 
And in the same way, prop tech firms are using data to understand markets, markets better and improve their offerings. Um, so there is that, that commonality between them. And as you quite both quite rightly pointed out, there's, there's that, well, in the smart city space, you call it interoperability, that, that issue. That is it's something that's pretty crucial to both these spaces that just aren't getting right. There's so much network technology now, and you can facilitate the inputs of so many different sources that you need to be able to figure out a way that, that these systems can speak to one another. And I'm sure Wayne remembers from not so long ago, we had a research project that we we're working on with these APIs and trying to get them to speak to one another to get data. And, and it all kind of, it was a, a real sticking point of that particular project. Yeah. Just, just clear in our minds, some of the conceptual ideas here, a digital city, smart cities. I mean, we hear all uh, these things coming our way. Uh, yeah. Are they different concepts or are they integrated? Yeah. Uh, there's, there's a lot of the, the appropriation of, of the smart city, the digital city, the ubiquitous city um, for various interests and, and various yeah, okay. disciplines. And, you know, it, it's very similar to what kind of what a couple decades or a decade ago, there was that buzzword of, of eco or, or, or green. And that got thrown around so much that it, it became quite lost what it was actually, or what was eco. And it's kind of similar what's happening now. Um, and in ways, I almost feel like it's better to not try and narrowly define what a smart city is or what a digital city is. If we want to think about it, we should maybe rather try and understand the linkages between kind of the human and institutional dimensions within a given context and technology and how that all kind of collides in the urban space. Because what smart is in Kinshasa might be completely different to what smart is in Singapore. Well, you know, and it leads to an interesting point. And I remember reading some time ago that we'll get to a point where, you know, one of the biggest issues in South Africa, for example, is many, many people don't have any title deeds, right? They don't have their title deeds or either it was not given to them at some point or it's too complicated to sort out because it was the aunt's mother's property back and no one wants, no, no conveyancer feels like sorting that out or it's too expensive to, to do that. I mean, can, can technologies really bring the property market to a lot of people who were denied the property market because of the institutional framework. So uh, is there a link between that? And, well, yeah. you know, the, 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 I mean, that's prop tech very differently to maybe some of the prop tech that we often talk about. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I can think of a pretty great example, um, which is being done um, and speaks quite nicely to where I see the smart city going, um, which, which we can discuss later. But, um, VPU, you have a program that they're working with where there's a system called OpenStreetMaps, where um, it's a, a completely open source um, platform where people around the world, there's over 20,000 volunteers, add um, things onto this map and populate various maps of the world. And what they've started doing is informal settlements is started mapping um, informal uh, plots, which then um, residents of these sites can then go and apply for, for credit at a bank. Um, at a formal banking institution through through this so there are very very definitely um, amazing benefits that can come out of this and we can start really looking at ways to integrate kind of excluded portions of our, of our population but at the same time if we go unchecked these 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 kind of technological um, interventions can also have the opposite effect uh, I'm, uh, I'm going to move this discussion on rob you wanted to intervene um, I, I just wanted to do just a, f a, f a follow up with Luke with respect to this space. Luke, uh, I've always argued that this prop tech and, and, and technological space, it can't just be about kind of fancy technology and cool technology. It's got to sort of address some of the underlying issues, et cetera. And I, I was wondering, you know, I was thinking of, of sort of three areas within a big city or if you were managing a city where this would help. I mean, the one is, is just understanding the complexity that you're dealing with. So that's the big yeah. using the big data to 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 understand that complexity. The other one is just to help with the the, the silo effect. We all know that every government around the world, this is not something unique to South Africa. Governments, you know, it's what what does one department know about what the other department's doing, and then that that ability for technology 
to, to, to bring about much stronger integration, um, I, I think is a space. And then thirdly, I just thought, you know, how we use infrastructure. We know infrastructure is becoming incredibly expensive, costly, um, and there's backlogs. But uh, somebody was pointing out a, a carpooling app to me the other day. And straight away there, you start to address congestion issues because you're now putting four people into a car instead of one and quite simple, et cetera. Are there sort of other areas, main sort of areas that you can think of where, where the technology can make a big issue or make a big impact? Uh, Rob, I think for me, um, and this kind of touches on um, what I spoke about now with, with the kind of the mapping of, of informal settlements. Um, the smart city technologies for me, they, they really have the potential to kind of radically configure uh, urban governance as we know it. So there's a lot of, there's a growing body of research around what's known as platform urbanism. And essentially, we have the technology now to, to, to facilitate the inputs of, of various different sources and pull you know, experts, both community experts and also experts from more technical types of disciplines and a variety of disciplines. And essentially, what the technology can do is facilitate a, a bottom-up and a top-down approach to solve a number of urban issues. So yeah, it's about that reconfiguration. And, and this may seem like a, an overly idealized view, but, but there are examples of this happening, like I just explained, and, and look at the open data movement. And, and you know, the civic in innovation space is, is quite a, a thriving kind of space, particularly in South Africa. And these are empowering citizens and enabling them to co-design solutions and provide services to their communities. And they're best place to do that. Sure. Um, still on a yeah, similar track, but um, do you think that for the price of a loaf of bread, uh, a farmer in Limpopo or the outside, back of Kenya can buy one millionth of the cent in shopping center in the years to come, you know, on the back of their, of their cell phone? Um, do you think that's a reality? Yeah, I think a short answer is yes. I think we have the technology. Um, it, it's just about, I think, having the will and also the, the interest from, from the private sector in this area because uh, a lot of what we talk about, it is amazing and it's important for our property markets. But when, you, when you're sitting in you know, an emerging market uh, in a very unequal society, we've mentioned you know, technology has, has the potential to do amazing things, but you know, uh, put you know, extra or... Uh, barriers in place in terms of society and access to resources opportunities so in in the property industry it's a really tough one because like you say um, access uh, to finance or investments in property is it's, it's not really available at uh, you know lower income groups at a more granular level so you mentioned fintech earlier um, we've mentioned fintech's an important part of this of this puzzle so that that area where um, prop tech and fintech or fintech and the property industry overlap is very interesting linked to things like crowdfunding and then like you said uh, perhaps tokenization and blockchain uh, you can break down assets for investments you can give uh, a whole you know portion of, of, of society and the population access to property as an investment savings vehicle that was was not you know even a remote possibility before uh, and then also enabling through platforms you know there's a lot of activity in sales and letting like we said great platforms um, which happen in, you know, in, in the sort of the, the middle, middle class to upper you know, income markets. But uh, I've, I've met people doing similar things for township markets and back, uh, back room rentals, these type of things. So uh, there's a lot of opportunity, I think, to tap into these township markets and, and lower income groups in a lot of ways. One, one is accessing investment, other is accessing space, uh, having a more formalized you know, platform method of of renting with, within the township markets and also the affordable space. Um, I think there's a lot to be done and there's a lot of opportunity. But like I said, I think it's the, perhaps it's the, the awareness, understanding from private sector. You know, they, they, there's been a place you've been operating for many years um, and, you know, there's perhaps a lack of understanding of other opportunities. Um, and it's often, often, you know, left to NGOs and, and that type of thing. But there's really exciting things. And East Africa has some of the most exciting examples of this in terms of using blockchain, mobile technology. Well, uh, I, I, I believe that in Kenya, the m system, you know, the, the sort of using your phone to pay for things is also becoming exactly. an investment platform. That's it. And, it's, and like you said, with a farmer investing in property or transacting on their phone, this is actually happening in Kenya. 
um, linked to the report um, I did this year with, with URA again on East Africa PropTech. Um, mm-hmm. it, they, there's mobile enabled technology. It's, it's in its infancy, but they basically want to enable people to invest and to transact with property, um, not even using smartphone technology in some instances. It's using uh, the mobile technology that drives in PESA. So I think there's a lot to be done. It's part of a, a bigger conversation, but technology and not necessarily sort of hardcore complex technology has a part to play in opening up um, uh, sort of township markets, like I said, affordable markets, housing uh, and all the rest of it in, in terms of use um, and investment, you know, help, helping people who rent their back rooms to do that more efficiently and also help them access funding. Uh, and there's even platforms like Ivil that are operating in a few countries that enable people to build those, those back rooms, either by micro lending or even arrangements with building supplies, construction, uh, sort of community crowdfunding, uh, the construction of these rooms. So that's a very interesting sort of yeah. social impact yeah. that, that is something to be aware of. Yeah. Sure, thank you very much. I think we're going to wrap up. Um, and I suppose that over the years, looking at the property market, we looked at typical steep social trends, technological, economic, environmental, political trends. But we always assumed that the property market would carry on pretty much the same way. So we had these exogenous forces impacting on the market, but the property market had a way of doing things. And I think that maybe what we're talking about now, and maybe on your final reflections, is is the way that we are doing things going to fundamentally alter in the next decade? Or are we going to append technologies and sort of carry on doing it the same way? Uh, It's going to make us a bit faster. It may lead to improvements, but we're still going to have a system where we're going to have an owner and then the between the owner and the investor, you have the bank, the valuer, the broker, a lot of intermediates in between. And that's the way the property market works. So I think your final reflection, and uh, Rob, feel free if you want to, to add to something in there before we be close. Um, Rob, do you want to add anything at this point? Yeah, I just maybe Wayne and, and Sean and, and, and I suppose to a lesser degree maybe Luke as well, just maybe to reflect on, on what I was sort of saying earlier on, which is kind of where does this technology space move to in terms of the, the value chain? But also I'd be curious to know what is, what do you think are the biggest impediments to people ab- adopting it? I mean, is there a pushback to adopting some of this technology and this new way of operating. Right? So there's some and, reflections on that would be useful. Uh, Rob, it's an interesting point. As somebody gave me the analogy, or I read it some time ago, we've got this genie in a bottle. Our, as human beings, are we going to let it out or are we going to keep the cap uh, on the bottle and let the genie out in bits and pieces as we decide to do it as human beings? Or is it just going to come out and do what it wants? Um, Wayne, would you like to start maybe reflecting at all? I mean, do you, do you see the way that we're going to do business completely alter, or is it just additions to doing the same thing? I think, you know, that's a difficult one to answer because, you know, everybody is talking about post, post-COVID as, as an example, yeah. and what is the world going to be like, and we're all going to be kinder and nicer and better people. I- and to be honest, I don't buy into that. I think <laughs> once the vaccine comes out, we're all going to go back to our horrible selves and, 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 and rape and pillage. Um, but I think... I through, think through technology, by the way. We, we used to do yeah, it through mining think, operations. Now, now we I will... Think, it. I think the one, the one reflection is that take commercial office space for, as an example, with people starting to understand that you can work remotely, there is going to be, have, there's going to have to be a different view on how we sell our space. You know, so for example, up until recently, if you were a REIT, you wanted a five-year lease 
over a thousand square meters because that tenant was the tenant you wanted. As to whether that is going to be the way forward is, I'm not so sure, I, I'm not saying that people will not work in offices, but the flexibility of, of being able to work from home ever so often or, or do certain things out of you know, satellite offices and headquarters and working differently um, are things that are going to probably influence how property owners sell their product. Right. One of the ways that they can probably manage that better would be through technology. So, for example, if you had a, if you had a flexible working space with shorter leases, etc., if you're needing to deal with that all the time, the one way to deal with that would be through technology, um, because physically it, it would be very difficult. And so I think, I think there are going to be changes. I think the one thing, Rob, is for people to understand that technology will be an enabler and not necessarily a takeaway. And, and, and that's one of the things I grapple with that when you speak to, to landlords, or you speak to, to big property brokerage places, it's, it's a case of, well, you, you're trying to take us away and we're not. We, we try to enable, we're trying to make you more efficient. It does not detract from the fact that the inept and the lazy are going to be without a job. But that was always going to be the case. You know, if, if you take the travel industry, it hasn't done away with the travel agents, but it has created a different space for travel agents to play in. I'm able to book my low, my cheap ticket to Joburg on my phone, but if I want to go on a family holiday to Asia, I use a travel agent because they've got particular skills and knowledge that can make sure that the trip is, is good. And so I think you're going to find different roles. That's the, the one. It's an enabler in that property. You don't buy, you don't only buy property off a spreadsheet. You know, people like to think that that's the way to do it, but some of it is also gut feel. And that gut feel is a function of understanding the market, etc., cetera, and, and what technology must be doing is making it a lot more efficient for you to gather the information, etc., to utilize your gut feel. You know, gut, I've got a greater gut feel than Taylor in the property space, not because I've got a bigger gut, but purely because I've been in the property space for longer. So I've got 30 years worth of experience that I pass off as a gut feel. Um, and, and I think that is what technology has to do. It needs to make it more efficient for us. It's not going to take it away. There's still going to be better property people than others yeah. because they understand the market, they can see a niche, etc. A, a system, an AI system, isn't going to make me the best property owner in Cape Town. I still need technology. I, I still need a certain ability. Wayne, thank you. And as the psychologist economist Kahneman said in that uh, book, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow, we've got level one thinking, level two. Level one is your intuition, but you also need to have the data to verify that your intuition isn't taking you in the wrong direction. And I think that's where data plays a, a, a critical role as well. So the two, and as they say, if there's too much information, that's where intuition kicks in um, often. Um, so just a few final thoughts, Sean, and then we're going to meet, uh, then, and then we'll move to Luke and we'll close. Sean. Great. Thanks, Ramsar. Uh, yeah, just to highlight the, the point Wayne made, I think that's really important that technology is an enabler. Um, and some may argue that's another buzzword that's meant to confuse them <laughs> and hide your intentions uh, with technology. But it is very true. It, I believe it creates more opportunity than, than it takes away from the industry and uh, you know, the property industry is right to, to embrace these things. A lot of things change, like you said, travel agents, mm -hmm. you know, companies who made pay phones uh, could ignore the trends to mobile phones, you know, but they'd be out of the business at some point. So you're, just, you, you're still in the same industry, you're just doing things a different way. Uh, and in terms of what Rob said, sort of uh, barriers or impediments, I think to, to the property industry uh, embracing technology on a meaningful level, uh, a lot of it is, I suppose, um, in the South African context, you know, we, we've dealt with a very difficult uh, economic environment in the last decade, I, I suppose you could say. And also, you know, our REITs, uh, who are the largest landlords and uh, who, you know, I feel are 
uh, the most well placed to sort of uh, drive technological innovation in our industry. They, they've been under a lot of pressure themselves. And I guess a lot of it's been about putting out fires. So they probably haven't had the luxury of looking at, you know, research and development, but um, this will change as they, the pressure, uh, you know, needs them, to, uh, forces them to cut costs more, look for more efficient ways to do things. And then the last point I wanted to make was, you know, at the end of the day, they're driven on, by what their users are asking for. Um, so that's the tenants and the customers who visit the tenants and like Wayne touched on how you want to use and interact with the space. You know, you want an on-demand space. Uh, you want an office for two hours because you've got a gap and then you, you're traveling somewhere else. Um, there's dark kitchens where, you know, takeaway uh, businesses, they just rent a kitchen and in a warehouse that contains multiple kitchens. Um, and then also how people interact with buildings. They'll probably demand smarter buildings, you know, office workers, want the sort of all the benefits of having technology in, in their workspace and, and all the rest of it in a similar way that the market started uh, and tenants started demanding green buildings. So I think users will push a lot of the change as well um, and then a, a need for innovation on, on the property players themselves. Thank you very much. Um, Luke, uh, a few final, you've got the advantage of being the last so you can reflect on everything and everybody's thoughts. Well, I also need to have to say less. Um, yeah, so I just your point, Francois, about how the the property sector is changing within. And, and I remember when you first said this, uh, what about four years ago? I, I thought it was very high in the sky, but you know, true to form, you called it, and and that's actually what's happening in the smart city space too. A lot of these technologies were brought up about to kind of bring in efficiencies, improve service delivery. But what's actually happening now is that urban governance is being starting to change from within the way cities are run completely instead of an optimization it's now reconfiguring who service providers are who your citizen is who the producer is um, so yeah that's a really interesting area and then i think in response to the the kind of the people who are resisting change um, from a smart city perspective I, I guess you know we need to be sympathetic of city governments because these are uncharted areas these are territories that they've never been before and your city has to be a pretty stable environment. There are a lot of people depending on, on the city and they tend to be risk averse for good reason. Um, so that's one of the things that are kind of is pushing back against these technologies. And, and then also you need to have the skills to be able to support this. You need that institu institutional change management to really be able to support the, the, the introduction of ICT and, and to really give it that impact. And then just a, a kind of a parting point, I think, you know, where I see this going in terms of the prop tech and the smart city space is, is looking at digital twins. I think that's something that's going to really start to kind of take off in the next couple of years. I mean, it already is starting to, but I think it's going to be a lot more mainstream and, and how kind of that those, the interoperability between your, your, your digital twins at the building and then at the city level and, and, and the massive potentials that that has for, for both prop tech and for also um, for the property sector and for urban management and development. Thank you very much, Luke everyone has said what the, what they've wanted to say so um thank you very much to you all um i think what this webinar really is starting to show is how far we've moved on uh with the debate how far prop tech has taken us how far we've seen the shifts in cities that we're moving up and I remember Rob, you saying to me a few years ago, Fonto, we've got to go beyond the cool applications. You know, uh, you know it, it, it was all good fun looking at all those clips and what was coming up next, but there's something much deeper starting to happen here uh, for, 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 from an economic, from a sociological, political management environment. And I think that that's going to be what will be interesting. And, uh, uh, so, Wayne, thank you very much uh, for being with us. Uh, Sean, thank you very much. Luke, uh, all for your views. Rob, for help, well, helping we do this together uh, in, in making this happen. And uh, from Coin Online, Kayla, thank you very much for, in the background, uh, making sure that uh, all this happened without Coin Online, we would certainly not be able to uh, bring uh, these webinars to you. Uh, and so, thank you very much for also su supporting the university. And I can tell you that what we've done here is we've created material which we will be sharing with university students 
as we start looking more and more uh, at the prop tech world and making sure that we have graduates that are immersed uh, in the thinking and materials. Thank you very much to you all. And I'd like to close now and hope to see you all at the next uh, webinar, which uh, Coin Online and the Urban Real Estate Research Unit at UCT will be delivering to you. Thank you very much.